the latest images from the Pragyan rover of Chandrayaan-3. It has been a week since Chandrayaan-3 reached the south pole of the moon. We will have more updates on the latest from Chandrayaan-3. Hello there, you are watching Inside South Asia with me, Dasani Atal. Despite India's concerns, Sri Lanka's Defence Ministry has given approval for the Chinese vessel Shi Yon 6 to come to Sri Lankan waters and work together along with Sri Lanka's National Aquatic Research and Development Agency. This has now sparked concerns in India. And here's why. Reports of a Chinese research vessel being allowed to dock in Sri Lanka's strategic port of Colombo and Hambantota for 17 days has raised alarm bells in New Delhi. Enough for the Indian Defence Minister to make a visit to the island nation this coming weekend, according to reports. India has officially lodged a complaint with Lanka for allowing the Chinese vessels a free run. The ship Xi'an 6 is slated to arrive on October 25th and will conduct joint ocean surveys with Sri Lankan agency NARA or the National Aquatic Resources Research and Development Agency. But there seems to be two versions coming out of Sri Lanka. While local papers said the Defence Ministry had given permission to the Chinese survey vessel, other reports suggested the decision was yet to be taken and that the President, Vikramasinghe, would decide after attending the Belt and Road Summit in China in October. The Chinese have called a ship a scientific research vessel crewed by 60 that carries out oceanography, marine geology and marine ecology tests. India, however, says these ships from China are surveillance and ballistic missile trackers. Over the past few years, many such Chinese vessels have docked at Sri Lankan ports. A similar expedition last year by a spacecraft tracking vessel had sparked security concerns for India. The Xi'an 6 visited Sri Lanka on the 20th of April 2022 and remained in the sea of Sri Lanka for a total of 10 days. In August last year, the Yuan Wang 5 was given permission to dock at the Hamban Dota port. India voiced concerns that the ship would be used to spy on its activities. During President Ranil Vikramasinghe's visit to India in July, Prime Minister Narendra Modi even raised the issue of India's strategic and security concerns vis-à-vis -vis China. But with Sri Lanka deep in Chinese debt, Vikramasinghe has a difficult job. The Hambantota port is on a 99-year lease to China. Sri Lanka is currently being economically propped up by IMF loans and the Paris Club of Creditor Nations, and China is one of its largest lenders. The Chinese have also expressed interest in investing in Lanka's northern and eastern provinces. But any development in the strategic port in the district of Trincomalee must be done in consensus with India as per the 13th Amendment of the Island Nations Constitution. Lanka's northern and eastern provinces are close to South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. And China has been aggressively pursuing this region. Unlike Sri Lanka's relationship with China that is driven at least in some parts by debt obligations, India has offered $4 billion as aid to Lanka including food, oil and aviation fuel after its economic crisis and remained a close strategic neighbour in the Indian Ocean region. Singh's visit is to reinstate that commitment. Even as President Ranil Vikramasinghe makes his first official visit to China in October, to look for new investments, reach trade agreements and resume funding for stalled projects. It's been six years since hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims were forced out of their homes in Rakhine, Myanmar. Squalid conditions at Bangladesh's refugee camps have brought about questions to the living standards of these marginalized communities. However, Human rights activists have now sounded the alarm 
on the possibility and the safety and security of the Rohingya Muslims returning back home. In light of this, the hopes and dreams of repatriation are now riddled with questions and doubt. It's called Genocide Day, an anniversary of their misery. Some 10,000 Rohingya Muslims gathered on a rainy August morning to hear speeches they've heard before, to remake vows and retake pledges that have turned routine and empty in a life of darkness. Truth is, these last six years here have pushed these Rohingya deeper and deeper into an endless abyss. The anniversary only highlights the squalor and helplessness that has dogged them. We could not ensure an education for our children. We could not move around freely. There is no visual development in our lives. It is stuck here. Persecution of the Rohingya in their original home, Rakhine State in Myanmar, hit a high in 2017. Over a million Rohingya were forced out to camps in Bangladesh's Cox's Bazaar. Life in the crowded camps of Cox's Bazaar is a daily testament to the indomitable spirit of the Rohingya people. Basic needs, food, water, shelter, health care are hard to come by in these crowded bylanes. Malnutrition is rampant. With the UN World Food Programme slashing aid, food allowances have shrunk. One calculation put it at 9 cents per person per meal. Add to that crime and violent outbursts that have plagued the camps, that have become home to armed groups and are used as staging posts for regional drug trafficking networks. Living under the tarpaulin shanties for years is an unimaginable and painful thing. There is now a food shortage as well. The next generation will have no future in here. We don't know what to do. It has been six years and we don't know how many more to wait. These people are not even officially recognized as refugees here because Bangladesh is not a signatory to the 1951 convention or its 1967 refugee protocol. They're not eligible for jobs or refugee rights and a respectable return home is their biggest dream. We request the world community to help Bangladesh and to pressurize Myanmar so that they clear the things in their parliament and repatriate the Rohingyas with their citizenship, rights and safety of lives and properties. As long as they don't do it, we request the world to keep the pressure on, staying beside the Rohingyas. Repatriation, integration, resettlement, the terms have been virtually done to death in the Rohingya scheme of things. U.S. Under Secretary for Civilian Security and Human Rights, Uzra Zaya, who visited Bangladesh in July, raised the need for a safe, dignified return to Myanmar for these people. Zaya had admitted the conditions for that don't exist. Repatriation remains a divisive issue. The challenges are undeniable. Their history in the Rakhine state of Myanmar and interactions with the Rakhine Buddhists and the crackdown by the military junta there make their return complex. A Myanmar government team visited Bangladesh in May this year to initiate a repatriation plan, a pilot of sorts. A group of Rohingya were taken to Rakhine in Myanmar to survey the situation there. Transit camps made for them there keep them apart from the population with no signs of the integration they want. Are the Rohingya willing to return to Myanmar to live as non-citizens? It's the devil on one side, the deep blue sea on the other. Repatriation in its real sense has a long way to go yet. The Kingdom of Bhutan, considered as one of the most secluded and peaceful places in the planet, is now considering a slashing its tourist fee of $200 per tourist by half. The country has purposely avoided tourism traffic. However, this new move is an aim to boost tourism in the country and in a way to boost the country's economy.
que as mãos. The land of the thunder dragon, Bhutan, has decided to open its arms to tourists. Come the 1st of September, the 200 US dollar sustainable development fee charged per visitor per night stands halved. The new rate will continue for four years. The big focus is attracting tourists for the September to December peak tourist season, which includes many religious and cultural events. The Department of Tourism attributed the move to the important role of the tourism sector in boosting economic growth, even as it stressed on the need for Bhutan to protect its culture and traditions. Most tourists come here for either for culture or environment. So culture is very important for us. Uh, and not just because tourists are coming uh, to Bhutan for culture, that's why it's important, but also our identity. I think it's also about what makes you happy. Uh, culture is a very, very important part of making you happy. So that's why it's very important for, for Bhutanese to preserve our culture. Reports say there's a growing focus in Bhutan on overhauling the tourism sector. The target is raising the contribution of tourism to its $3 billion economy to 20% from the current 5%. Bhutan has traditionally looked to keep itself isolated from what it calls the ills of mass tourism. Protecting its mountains and landscapes from the carbon generated by a tourist influx has been primary. That has changed, as has the focus towards revenue from tourism. As late as 1974, when Bhutan finally opened to tourists, it received just 300 visitors. By 2019, 45 years later, the number touched 315,000. The tourist fee then was 65 US dollars per tourist per night. Tourism revenue was calculated at 84 million dollars annually. The COVID travel ban hit the industry hard. Tourist fee was raised to 200 dollars post COVID. 56,000 foreign tourists have visited Bhutan so far this year. 42,000 of them were Indians who paid just $14.5 as tourist fee every day. The tourist fee cut to $100 hopes to change that. Bhutan looking to woo tourists this way marks a unique shift. Protecting nature and peace and its pristine brilliance gives way to economic needs and pressures. Some are happy, some certainly aren't. Up next, we bring you the latest developments from the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Solar-powered Vikram and Pragyan will be carrying out experiments this week as well on the Lunar's South Pole. Take a look at these interesting findings that are sure to change the space research game. Smile please. This one click captures the emotions of a billion dreams. The Pragyan rover clicked not one but multiple photographs of the Vikram lander with its navigation camera. This becomes the story of two space buddies, or if we may call them, best friends, Vikram and Pragyan. As India walks on the moon, here's digging into the details of this milestone mission. Chandrayaan 3 marks many firsts. India's first soft landing on a celestial body. We have achieved Soft landing on the moon, India is on the moon. India's first rover operation on a celestial body. And humanity's first ever soft landing near the lunar south pole. Each of these are historic in their own way. Let's remember that the Indian lander and rover have one more week or one half of the lunar day to study the areas near the landing site. Chandrayaan 3's Vikram lander and Pragyan rover are completely dependent on harnessing the power of the sun. This is precisely why ISRO has planned the mission duration of Chandrayaan-3 for exactly two weeks. These two weeks are when it will be lunar day on the moon and this is the time when it can completely charge its batteries using its solar panels and thereby conduct all its in-situ experiments. So far, the Chandrayaan-3 probe has completed one week near the lunar south pole. India's space agency ISRO has been able to demonstrate successful operation of all the science experiments or payloads on board the propulsion module that's circling the moon, the lander module and the six-wheel rover. One of the biggest takeaways is the findings of sulphur. 
Using its onboard laser induced breakdown spectrometer, the Pragyan rover has been able to unambiguously detect the presence of sulfur near the Luna South Pole. In addition to this, there are at least seven elements that it has identified. This includes aluminium, iron, titanium, and silicon. Let's also remember that these are just detections. Oxygen also has been detected in this list. These are only preliminary findings, and the actual findings and the proper data will take months for it to be analyzed and for tangible outcomes to be reached. The temperature analysis of the lunar soil is also being analyzed at the landing site near the South Pole. In earlier missions, soil temperature has been measured only in equatorial regions of the Moon. During the lunar day, it is observed that the surface temperature of the lunar topsoil is more than 50 degrees centigrade, which is equivalent to India's desert temperatures during the peak summer. When the temperature probe was lowered 8 centimeters into the lunar soil, the temperature dropped a whopping 60 degrees centigrade. 8 centimeters beneath the topsoil, the temperature is minus 10 degrees centigrade. That's the temperature you see in the coldest regions of the Earth during the onset of winter. This indicates many things. For one, that the lunar soil is a poor conductor of heat, meaning it's a great insulator. However hot it gets on top, down below it's freezing cold. So hopes are very much alive that there could be frozen water in these regions. There's no doubt that Chandrayaan-3 is the clear front-runner in exploring the lunar south pole. At least 10 missions from space agencies and private firms will be lifting off in the next 12 months and heading for the moon. That's how high a priority lunar exploration has now become globally. In so many ways, Chandrayaan-3 shows the way. Up next, let's take a look at a few other stories that have made headlines in South Asia. The Netherlands is all set to return colonial era artifacts to Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan Minister for Culture, Vidura Vikramanakya, signed a legal document in Colombo with the Dutch State Secretary for Culture and Media. Gune Oslo to facilitate the transfer. This is a historical event. A moment that Sri Lanka has been waiting for ages, I should say. We want to, well, build also together a uh, common future uh, with closer cooperation, with closer cooperation in the fields of museums, um, collection, uh, research, collection management, exhibitions, uh, exchanging knowledge, uh, expertise. The ownership of cultural artifacts will be returned later this year. Among those expected to be handed back is the blue and gold Cannon of Candy, seized in 1765 by soldiers of the Dutch East Company. Back in 2020, the Dutch National Museum stated that at least 4,000 objects in its collections have clear ties to the country's colonial empire, which spanned some 300 years from the mid-17th century and whose main centers of power were in South Asia and the Caribbean. Another day, another Taliban ban, adding to a long list of restrictions aimed at shrinking women's access to public places Afghanistan's Taliban have now banned women from visiting one of the most popular national parks in the country. The ban was announced after the acting minister of Vice and Virtue complained that women visiting the park had not been adhering to the proper way of wearing the hijab. Just days before, Taliban had also barred young Afghani women from leaving the country to study in the UAE. According to reports, the Taliban-led regime stopped close to 60 young Afghan women from travelling to Dubai to pursue higher education. The Taliban has banned solo travel for women and only allowed them to go abroad with their husbands or a related male companion such as a brother, uncle or father, known as Maram, a male escort. Remember, the Taliban administration have closed universities and high schools to female students in Afghanistan. Rising air pollution can cut life expectancy by more than five years per person in South Asia. This dire consequence was revealed 
in a report by the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute. The region, which includes the world's most polluted countries of Bangladesh, India, Nepal and Pakistan, accounts for more than half of the total life years lost globally to pollution. Rapid industrialization and population growth have contributed to declining air quality in the Indian subcontinent. Where particulate pollution levels are currently more than 50% higher than at the start of the century and now overshadow dangers posed by larger health threats. And that's all we have for you on our show this week. But before we leave, take a look at these hair raising visuals of a lioness walking the busy streets of Karachi that definitely caused a stir. For the Weon team, I'm Dasani Atada, signing off.